Wow. Hello, everyone. I would like to take you through a little trip in time. And we'll go from the distant past to our future. And I'd like to begin by asking you to imagine that you're gazing at the night sky many thousands of years ago. You're looking up, and you can tell that things are slowly changing, but you don't know how to explain what you see. You think about it, and then you have a sudden prehistoric aha moment. You run and tell all your fellow tribesmates, hey, those things up there are alive. Your transformative idea that the heavens are alive will sweep through our consciousness and change us all forever. Your descendants will look to the heavens for explanations of the many mysteries taking place in the world around them. And they will tell endless stories based on the limited knowledge in the distant past when people believed that the earth was governed by supernatural beings. Many of their stories have been passed down for millennia. We know that the Egyptians were aware of the wanderings of Mars in the sky more than 3,500 years ago. But we also know that for the Greeks, Mars, whom they called Ares, was more than a mere vagabond. Mars was a god to be feared. We even find in Homer's Iliad, the chief god Zeus actually chastising Mars. Hey, Mars, of all the gods that tread the spangled skies, you're the most unjust. You're the most odious in our eyes. Inhuman discord is your dire delight, the waste of slaughter and the rage of fight. Mars, you are one bad dude. Well, today, we see these stories as merely entertaining myths. Yet, we are still looking to Mars and beyond for explanations of ourselves and our origins. And just as ancient stories reflected a desire to know where we came from and where we were going, our modern stories are mirrors of who we have become and who we aspire to be. So what kind of stories do we tell today? When we talk about Mars, we talk about how its early oceans and atmosphere must have been like the oceans and atmosphere here on Earth more than three and a half billion years ago. We know, too, that Mars had all the ingredients for life, including liquid water, evidence for which we have found at the base of Gale Crater, which once was a lake bed. So we tell stories about the geology and the chemistry that could have given rise to microbes early in Mars history. And those stories lead us to questions from which we're developing new narratives. If life arose on Mars, what happened to it? Can we find evidence of past life on Mars today? Can we find anything living on Mars today? Answering these questions is important for understanding life on Earth and our place in it. Did life arise elsewhere in the solar system or is life on Earth unique? How fragile is life once it arises? What evolutionary paths lead to flourishing biospheres? What paths lead to extinctions? What path are we now on? Recent evidence from Earth and from Mars is helping us answer some of these questions and setting the stage for the next steps in our journey. Images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have revealed liquid water slowly flowing down some of the slopes of Mars craters. And this is astonishing because liquid water is so crucial for the prospects of life. But we know that liquid water can exist on Mars only in the form of extremely concentrated brines with just traces of the organic food that microbes normally need to survive. So could anything be surviving in these brines? Well, 
In my labs here at Louisiana State University, we have discovered a kind of microbe that might just be able to do it. We have isolated microbes from the Bonneville salt flats that grow in brines so concentrated salt crystals precipitate from them. And these amazing microbes are able to breathe carbon monoxide, CO, for their energy. For we humans, CO is an extremely toxic gas. But for the microbes we work with, it's like a gaseous candy bar that provides energy they can use for survival. And this is not just a mere lab curiosity because we know that there's enough CO in Mars atmosphere to serve as a source of food in the absence of organic food. And even more remarkable, our microbes don't need oxygen to survive like we do. Instead of breathing oxygen, they can eat things like perchlorate, which is a rocket propellant that's abundant in Mars soil. And that's no mere lab curiosity either because we know there's very little oxygen in Mars atmosphere. These stories about brines on Mars and the novel microbes that might be able to survive in them are just a few examples of the many stories that are taking us closer to the day when we'll begin telling our stories from Mars itself. But how will we get there? We know we face enormous challenges. For one, we don't know how to provide food for astronaut crews without resupplying them during the three years it takes to get from Earth to Mars and back. We don't know how to provide all the air they'll need to breathe or all the clean water they'll need to drink. But we might be able to solve some of these problems if we can invent tiny machines that reproduce themselves and repair themselves and that can be programmed to make a wide range of useful products. Fortunately, these machines already exist. We call them microbes. All we need to do is use the toolkit of synthetic biology to create teams of microbial astronauts carrying out tasks in support of human astronauts. And the microbes we work with are a great place to start the engineering because they make natural plastics that can be used for spare parts and for tools and medical devices. They produce compounds that can be used as uh, food additives and medicines they can be trained to detoxify waste and purify water, and they can even produce uh, oxygen from reactions that would be useful for our astronauts. But before we head off on our exciting new adventures to tell our new stories, we have to stop and ask a question here on Earth. Why should we be going to Mars at all? I have two responses for you. The first is that in going to Mars, we will get one step closer to answering one of the questions that's at the core of most of our science stories. Do we share the universe with other forms of life or not? Think of what a game changer it will be to know that life exists elsewhere. The day we discover life on Mars or beyond will be the day that the stories we tell change forever. And there's every reason to believe that new stories will mean new hope for our future. And it will be equally profound to find that life exists only here. For then we will know what an enormous responsibility we have as Earth stewards. Sustaining the Earth and all of its life will become the greatest story we ever tell. The second idea is that going to Mars is not just about what we'll find when we get there. Instead, Mars remains a mirror for humanity, just as it always has been. Many of the problems we face in sustaining ourselves here on Earth are similar to the problems we face in sustaining exploration on Mars. How can we produce enough food when clean water is becoming increasingly scarce? How can we grow enough crops when our soils are becoming increasingly salty? How can we maintain a human-friendly atmosphere? Answering these questions for Mars will provide answers we can use here on Earth. And we know this is true because benefits for society and new technologies have always been the outcome of exploration. 
when we look to the horizon, when we look beyond to the stars, what we see reflected in the celestial mirror is the best of who we are. Pioneers, inventors, collaborators, working together to produce a shared future that's calling out to us like Mars in the distant sky. Yo, come on up, you'll like it. Thank you.